Part two, chapter twelve of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerk Part Two, Chapter Twelve Through Dr. Gould's unceasing labors during his fifteen years residence at Cordoba, a detailed acquaintance with southern stars was brought about. His Uranometria Argentina, 1879, enumerates the magnitudes of eight thousand one hundred and ninety eight out of ten thousand six hundred and forty nine stars visible to the naked eye under those transparent skies thirty three thousand one hundred and sixty down to nine and one half magnitude are embraced in his zones the argentine general catalogue of thirty two thousand four hundred and sixty eight southern stars was published in eighteen eighty six valuable work of the same kind has been done at the leander mccormick observatory virginia by professor o stone while the late redcliffe observers cape catalogue for eighteen eighty affords inestimable aid to the practical astronomer south of the line which has been reinforced with several publications issued by the present astronomer royal at the cape moreover the gigantic task entered upon in eighteen sixty by dr c h f peters director of the litchfield observatory clinton new york and of which a large installment was finished in eighteen eighty two deserves honorable mention it was nothing less than to map all stars down to and even below the fourteenth magnitude situated within thirty degrees on either side of the ecliptic and so to afford a sure basis for drawing conclusions with respect to the changes going on in the starry heavens it is tolerably safe to predict that no work of its kind and for its purpose will ever again be undertaken in a small part of one night stars can now be got to register themselves more numerously and more accurately than by the eye and hand of the most skilled observer in the course of a year fundamental catalogues constructed by the old time-honored method will continue to furnish indispensable starting points for measurement and one of especial excellence was published by professor newcomb in eighteen ninety nine but the relative places of the small crowded stars the sidereal of hoi Folloi, will henceforth be derived from their autographic statements on the sensitive plate even the secondary purpose that of asteroidal discovery served by detailed stellar enumeration is more surely attained by photography than by laborious visual comparison for planetary movement betrays itself in a comparatively short time by turning the imprinted image of the object affected by it from a dot into a trail in the arduous matter of determining star distances progress has been steady and bids fair to become rapidly accelerated together yet independently gill and elkin carried out at the cape observatory in eighteen eighty two eighty three an investigation of remarkable accuracy into the parallaxes of nine southern stars one of these was the famous alpha centauri 
the distance of which from earth was ascertained to be just one-third greater than henderson had made it the parallax of sirius on the other hand was doubled or its distance halved while canopus proved to be quite immeasurably remote a circumstance which considering that among all the stellar magnitude it is outshone only by the radiant dog star gives a stupendous idea of its real splendor and dimensions inquiries of this kind were for some years successfully pursued at the observatory of dunsink near dublin annual perspective displacements were by dr brunau detected in several stars and in others re-measured with a care which inspired just confidence his parallax for alpha lyrae point thirteen minutes was authentic though slightly too large elkin's final results gave pi equal point zero eight two minutes and the received value for the parallax of the swiftly travelling star groombridge eighteen thirty scarcely differs from that arrived at by him in eighteen seventy one pi equals point zero nine minutes his successor as astronomer royal for ireland sir robert stawell ball now laudian professor of astronomy in the university of cambridge has done good service in the same department for besides verifying approximately struve's parallax of half a second of arc for sixty one signi he refuted in eighteen eleven by a sweeping search for so-called large parallaxes certain baseless conjectures of comparative nearness to the earth in the case of red and temporary stars of four hundred and fifty objects thus cursorily examined only one star of the seventh magnitude numbered one thousand six hundred and eighteen in groombridge circumpolar catalogue gave signs of measurable vicinity similarly a reconnaissance among rapidly moving stars lately made by dr chase with the yale heliometer yielded no really large and only eight appreciably parallaxes among the ninety-two subjects of his experiments a second campaign in stellar parallax was undertaken by gill and elkin in eighteen eighty seven but this time the two observers were in opposite hemispheres both used heliometers dr elkin had charge of the fine instrument then recently erected in yale college observatory sir david gill employed one of seven inches just constructed under his directions in first-rate style by the repsolds of hamburg dr elkin completed in eighteen eighty eight his share of the more immediate joint program which consisted in the determination by direct measurement of the average parallax of stars of the first magnitude it came out for the ten northern luminaries after several revisions point zero nine minutes equivalent to a light journey of thirty three years the deviations from this average were indeed exceedingly wide two of the stars betelgo and signi gave no certain sign of any perspective shifting of the rest procyon with a parallax of point three three four minutes proved the nearest to our system at the mean distance concluded for these ten brilliant stars the sun would show as of only fifth magnitude hence it claims a very subordinate rank among the suns of space sir david gill's definitive results were published in nineteen hundred 
as the average parallax of the eleven brightest stars in the southern hemisphere they gave point thirteen minutes a value enhanced by the exceptional proximity of alpha centauri yet four of these conspicuous objects canopus rigel spica and beta crucis gave no sign of perspective response to the annual change in our point of view the list included eleven fainter stars with notable proper motions and most of these proved to have fairly large parallaxes among other valuable contributions to this difficult branch may be instance bruno peters measurement of eleven stars with the leipzig heliometer eighteen eighty seven to eighteen ninety two captain's application of the method by differences in right ascension to fifteen stars observed on the meridian eighteen eighty five to eighteen eighty nine and flint's more recent similar determinations at madison wisconsin the great merit of having rendered photography available for the sounding of the celestial depths belongs to professor pritchard the subject of his initial experiment was sixty one signi from measurements of two hundred negatives taken in eighteen eighty six he derived for that classic star a parallax of point four three eight minutes a satisfactory agreement with balls of point four six eight minutes a detailed examination convinced the astronomer royal of its superior accuracy to bessel's result with the heliometer the civilian professor carried out his project of determining all second magnitude stars to the number of about thirty conveniently observable at oxford obtaining as the general outcome of the research an average parallax of point zero five six minutes for the objects of that rank but this value though in itself probable cannot be accepted as authoritative in view of certain inaccuracies in the work adverted to by jacobi herman davis and gill the method has nevertheless very large capabilities professor captain showed in eighteen eighty nine practicability of deriving parallaxes wholesale from plates exposed at due intervals and applied his system in nineteen hundred with encouraging success to a group of two hundred and forty eight stars the apparent absence of spurious shiftings justified the proposal to follow up the completion of the astrographic chart with the initiation of a photographic parallax durchmusterung observers of double stars are among the most meritorious and need to be among the most patient and painstaking workers in sidereal astronomy they are scarcely as numerous as could be wished dr doberk distinguished as a computer of stellar orbits complained in eighteen eighty two that data sufficient for the purpose had not been collected for above thirty or forty binaries out of between five and six hundred certainly or probably within reach the progress since made is illustrated by mr gore's useful catalogue of computed binaries including fifty-nine entries presented to the royal irish academy june ninth eighteen ninety few have done more towards supplying the deficiency of materials than the late baron ercole dembowski of milan he devoted the last thirty years of his life which came to an end on january nineteenth eighteen eighty one 
to the revision of the Dorpat catalogue, and left behind him a store of micrometrical measures as numerous as they are precise. Of living observatories in this branch, Mr. S. W. Burnham is beyond question the foremost. While pursuing legal avocations at Chicago, he diverted his scanty leisure by exploring the skies with a six-inch telescope mounted in his back yard, and had discovered in May 1882 one thousand close and mostly very difficult double stars summoned as chief assistant to the new lick observatory in eighteen eighty eight he resumed the work of his predilection with the thirty six inch and twelve inch refractors of that establishment but although devoting most of his attention to much needed remeasurements of known pairs he incidentally divided no less than two hundred and seventy four stars the majority of which lay beyond the resolving power of less keen and effectually aided eyesight one of his many interesting discoveries was that of a minute companion to alpha ursae majoris the first pointer which already gives unmistakable signs of orbital movement round the shining orb it is attached to another pair kappa pegasi detected in eighteen eighty was found in eighteen ninety two to have more than completed a circuit in the interim its period of a little over eleven years is the shortest attributable to a visible binary system except that of delta equile provisionally determined by professor hussey in nineteen hundred at five point seven years and indicated by spectroscopic evidence to be of uncommon brevity burnham's catalogue of twelve hundred and ninety double stars discovered by him from eighteen seventy one to eighteen ninety nine is a record of unprecedented interest nearly all the six hundred and ninety pairs included in it two minutes or less than two minutes apart must be physically connected and they offer a practically unlimited field for investigation while the notes diagrams and orbits appended profusely to the various entries are eminently helpful to students and computers the author is continuing his researches at the yerkes observatory having quitted the lick establishment in eighteen ninety two the first complete enrollment of southern double stars was made by mr r t a innes in eighteen ninety nine the couples enumerated twenty one per cent of which are separated by less than one second of arc are two thousand one hundred and forty in number they include three hundred and five discovered by himself dr c gathered a rich harvest of nearly five hundred new southern pairs with the lowell twenty four inch refractor in eighteen ninety seven professor hoff's discoveries in more northerly zones amounted to six hundred and twenty three hussey's at lick to three hundred and fifty and aitken's already to over three hundred there is as yet no certainty that the stars of sixty one cygni form a true binary combination mr burnham indeed holds them to be in course of definitive separation and professor hall's observations at washington eighteen seventy nine to eighteen ninety one although favoring their physical connection 
are far from decisive on the point. Dr. Wilsing, from certain anomalous displacements of their photographed images, concluded in 1893 the presence of an invisible third member of the system revolving in a period of 22 months, but the effects noticed by him were probably illusory. Important series of double star observations were made by Perotin at Nice in 1883 to 1884 by Hall with the 26 inch Washington Equatorial 1874 to 1891 by Shia Pirelli from 1875 onward by Glasnap, O. Stone, Leavenworth, Seabrook, and many besides. Finally, Professor Hussey's revision of the Polkowa catalogue is a work of Terris Atke Rodundus kind, which leaves little or nothing to be desired. The methods employed in double star determinations remain, at the beginning of the twentieth century, essentially unchanged. The camera has scarcely encroached upon this part of the micrometer's domain. A research of striking merit into the origin of binary stars was published in 1892 by Dr. T. J. J. C. in the form of an inaugural dissertation for his doctor's degree in the University of Berlin. The main result was to show the powerful effects of tidal friction in prescribing the course of their development from double nebulae revolving almost in contact to double suns far apart yet inseparable. The high eccentricities of their eventual orbits were shown to result necessarily from this mode of action, which must operate with enormous strength on closely con conjoined, nearly equal masses, such as the rapidly revolving pairs disclosed by the spectroscope. That these are still in an early stage of their life history is probable in itself, and is reaffirmed by the exceedingly small density indicated for the eclipsing stars by the ratio of phase duration to period. Stellar photometry, initiated by the elder Herschel, and provided with exact methods by his son at the Cape, by Steinheil and Seidel at Munich, has of late years assumed the importance of a separate department of astronomical research. Two monumental works on the subject, compiled on opposite sides of the Atlantic, were thus appropriately coupled in the bestowal of the Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal in 1886. Harvard College Observatory led the way under the able direction of Professor E. C. Pickering. His photometric catalog of 4,260 stars, constructed from nearly 95,000 observations of light intensity during the years 1879 to 82, constitutes a record of incalculable value for the detection and estimation of stellar variability. It was succeeded in 1885 by Professor Pritchard's Uranometria Nova Oxoniensis, including photometric determinations of the magnitude of all naked eye stars from the pole to 10 degrees south of the equator to the number of 2,784. The instrument employed was the wedge photometer, which measures brightness by resistance to extinction. A wedge of neutral tint glass 
accurately divided to scale is placed in the path of the stellar rays when the thickness of it they have power to transverse furnishes a criterion of their intensity professor pickering's meridian photometer on the other hand is based upon zollner's principle of equalization effected by a polarizing apparatus after all however as professor pritchard observed the eye is the real photometer and its judgment can only be valid over a limited range absolute uniformity then in estimates made by various means under varying conditions and by different observers is not to be looked for and it is satisfactory to find substantial agreement attainable and attained only in an insignificant fraction of the stars common to the harvard and oxford catalogues discordances are found exceeding one-third of a magnitude a large proportion seventy one per cent agree within one-fourth a considerable minority thirty one per cent within one-tenth of a magnitude the harvard photometry was extended on the same scale to the opposite pole in a catalogue of the magnitudes of seven thousand nine hundred and twenty two southern stars founded on professor bailey's observation in peru eighteen eighty nine to eighteen ninety one measurements still more comprehensive were subsequently executed at the primary establishment with a meridian photometer of augmented power the surprising number of four hundred and seventy three thousand two hundred and sixteen settings were made during the years eighteen ninety one to ninety eight nearly all by the infatigable director himself and they afforded materials for a photometric durchmusterung published in nineteen o one including all stars of seven point five magnitude north of declaration minus forty degrees a photometric zone twenty degrees wide has for some time been in course of observation at potsdam by m m muller and kempf the instrument employed by them is constructed on a polarizing principle as adapted by zollner photographic photometry has meanwhile risen to an importance if anything exceeding that of visual photometry for the usefulness of the great international star chart now being prepared would be gravely compromised by systematic mistakes regarding the magnitude of the stars registered upon it no tr entirely trustworthy means of determining them have however yet been found there is no certainty as to the relative times of exposure needed to get images of stars representative of successive photometric ranks all that can be done is to measure the proportionate diameters of such images and to infer by the application of a law learned from experience the varied intensities of light to which they correspond the law is indeed neither simple nor constant different investigators have arrived at different formula which being purely empirical vary their nature with the conditions of the experiment probably the best expedient for overcoming the difficulty is that devised by pickering of simultaneously photographing a star and its secondary image reduced in brightness by a known amount the results of its use will be exhibited in a catalogue of forty thousand stars to the tenth magnitude 
one for each square degree of the heavens a photographic photometry of all the lucid stars modeled on the visual photometry of eighteen eighty four is promised from the same copious source of novelties the magnitudes of the stars in the draper catalogue were determined so to speak spectrographically the quantity measured in all cases was the intensity of the hydrogen line near g by the employment of this definite and uniform test results were obtained of special value indeed but in strong disaccord with those given by less exclusive determinations thought meanwhile cannot be held aloof from the great subject upon the future illustration of which so much patient industry is being expended nor are partial glimpses denied to us of relations fully discoverable perhaps only through centuries of toil some important points in cosmical economy have indeed become quite clear within the last fifty years and scarcely any longer admit of a difference of opinion one of these is that of the true status of nebulae this was virtually settled by sir j herschel's description in eighteen forty seven of the structure of the magellanic clouds but it was not until Wewell in eighteen fifty three and herbert spencer in eighteen fifty eight enforced the conclusions necessarily to be derived therefrom that the conception of the nebulae as remote galaxies which lord ross's resolution of many into stellar points had appeared to support began to withdraw into the region of discarded and half-forgotten speculations in the nebulae as Wewell insisted there coexist in a limited compass and in indiscriminate position stars clusters of stars nebulae regular and irregular and nebulous streaks and patches these then are different kinds of things in themselves not merely different to us there are such things as nebulae side by side with stars and with clusters of stars nebulous matter resolvable occurs close to nebulous matter irresolvable this argument from coexistence in nearly the same region of space reiterated and reinforced with others by mr spencer was urged with his accustomed force and freshness by mr proctor it is unanswerable there is no maintaining nebulae to be simply remote worlds of stars in the face of an agglomeration like the nebula major containing in its certainly capacious bosom both stars and nebula add the facts that a considerable proportion of these perplexing objects are gaseous and that an intimate relation obviously subsists between the mode of their scattering and the lie of the milky way and it becomes impossible to resist the conclusion that both nebular and stellar systems are parts of a single scheme as to the stars themselves the presumption of their approximate uniformity in size and brightness has been effectually dissipated differences of distance can no longer be invoked to account for dissimilarity in lustre minute orbs altogether invisible without optical aid are found to be indefinitely nearer to us than such radiant objects as canopus betelco or rigal moreover intensity of light is perceived to be a very imperfect index to real magnitude 
brilliant suns are swayed from their course by the attractive power of massive yet faintly luminous companions and suffer eclipse from obscure interpositions besides effective luster is now known to depend no less upon the qualities of the investing atmosphere than upon the extent and radiative power of the stellar surface red stars must be far larger in proportion to the light diffused by them than white or yellow stars there can be no doubt that our sun would be at least double its brightness were the absorption suffered by its rays to be reduced to the Syrian standard, and, on the other hand, that it would lose half its present efficiency as a light source if the atmosphere partially veiling its splendors were rendered as dense as that of Aldebaran. Thus, Variety of all kinds is seen to abound in the heavens, and it must be admitted that the consequent insecurity of all hypotheses as to the relative distances of individual stars singularly complicates the question of their allocation in space. Nevertheless, something has been learnt, even on that point, and the tendency of modern research is, on the whole, strongly confirmatory of the views expressed by Herschel in 1802. He then no longer regarded the Milky Way as the mere visual effect of an enormously extended stratum of stars, but as an actual aggregation, highly irregular in structure, made up of stellar clouds and groups and nodosities. All the facts since ascertained fit in with this conception to which Proctor added arguments favoring the view since adopted by Barnard and Easton that the stars forming the galactic stream are not only situated more closely together but are also really as well as apparently of smaller dimensions than the lucid orbs studding our skies by the laborious process of isographically charting the whole of argelander's three hundred and twenty four thousand stars he brought out in eighteen seventy one signs of relationship between the distribution of the brighter stars and the complex branchings of the milky way which has been stamped as authentic by newcomb's recent statistical inquiries there is besides a marked condensation of stars especially in the southern hemisphere toward a great circle inclined some twenty degrees to the galactic plane and these were supposed by gould to form with the sun a subordinate cluster of which the components are seen projected upon the sky as a zone of stellar brilliance the zone has however galactic rather than solar affinities and represents perhaps not a group but a stream the idea is gaining ground that the milky way is designed in its main outlines on a spiral pattern and that its various branches and sections are consequently situated at very different distances from ourselves proctor gave a preliminary interpretation of their complexities on this principle and easton of rotterdam has renewed the attempt with better success a most suggestive delineation of the milky way completed in eighteen eighty nine after five years of labor by dr otto bodecker lord ross's astronomer at parsonstown was published by lithography in eighteen ninety two 
it showed a curiously intricate structure composed of dimly luminous streams and shreds and patches intermixed with dark gaps and channels ramifications from the main trunk ran out toward the andromeda nebula and the beehive cluster in cancer involved the pleiades and hyades and winding round the constellation of orion just attained the sword handle nebula the last delicate touches had scarcely been put to the picture when the laborious eye and hand method was in this quarter as already in so many others superseded by a more expeditious process professor barnard took the first photographs ever secured of the true milky way july twenty eighth august first and second eighteen eighty nine at the lick observatory special conditions were required for success above all a wide field and a strong light grasp both complied with through the use of a six-inch portrait lens even thus the sensitive plate needed some hours to pick out the exceedingly faint stars collected in the galactic clouds these cannot be photographed under the nebulous aspect they wear to the eye the camera takes note of their real nature and registers their constituent stars rank by rank hence the difficulty of disclosing them in the photographs made with the six-inch portrait lens professor bernard wrote besides myriads of stars there are shown for the first time the vast and wonderful cloud forms with all their remarkable structure of lanes holes and black gaps and sprays of stars they present to us these forms in all their delicacy and beauty as no eye or telescope can ever hope to see them in plate six one of these strange galactic landscapes is reproduced it occurs in the bow of sagittarius not far from the trifid nebula where the aggregations of the milky way are more than usually varied and characteristic one of their distinct features comes out with particular prominence it will be noticed that the bright mass near the center of the plate is tunneled with dark holes and furrowed by dusty lanes such interruptions recur perpetually in the milky way they are exemplified on the largest scale in the great rift dividing it into two branches all the way from cygnus to crux and they are reproduced in miniature in many clusters mr h c russell at sydney in eighteen ninety successfully imitated professor barnard's example his photographs of the southern milky way have many points of interest they show the great rift black to the eye yet densely star-strewn to the perception of the chemical retina while the coal sack appears absolutely dark only in its northern portion his most remarkable discovery however was that of the spiral character of the two nebecula with an effective exposure of four and a half hours the greater cloud came out as a complex spiral with two centers while the similar conformation of its minor companion developed only after eight hours of persistent actinic action the revelation is full of significance scarcely less so although after a different fashion it is the disclosure on plates exposed by dr max wolf with a five-inch lens in june eighteen ninety one 
of a vastly extended nebula bringing some of the leading stars in cygnus into apparently organic connection with the piles of galactic star dust likewise involved by it barnard has similarly found great tracts of the milky way to be photographically nebulous and the conclusion seems inevitable that we see in it a prodigious mixed system resembling that of the pleiades in point of composition though differing widely from it in plan of structure of corroborative testimony moreover is the discovery independently resulting from gill's and pickering's photographic reviews that stars of the first type of spectrum largely prevail in the galactic zone of the heavens with approach to that zone captain noticed a steady growth of actinic intensity relative to visual brightness in the stars depicted on the cape durchmusterung plates in other words stellar light is in the milky way bluer than elsewhere and the reality of the primitive character hence to be inferred for the entire structure was in a manner certified by mr mclean's observation that helium stars the supposed immediate products of nebulous matter crowd towards its medial plane the first step toward the unravelment of the tangled web of stellar movements was taken when herschel established the reality and indicated the direction of the sun's journey but the gradual shifting backward of the whole of the celestial scenery amid which we advance accounts for only a part of the observed displacements the stars have motions of their own besides those reflected upon them from ours all attempts however to grasp the general scheme of these motions have hitherto failed yet they have not remained wholly fruitless the community of slow movements in taurus upon which maedler based his famous theory has proved to be a fact and one of very extended significance in eighteen seventy mr proctor undertook to chart down the directions and proportionate amounts of about sixteen hundred proper motions as determined by messrs stone and main with the result of bringing to light the remarkable phenomenon termed by him star drift quite unmistakably large groups of stars otherwise apparently disconnected were seen to be in progress together in the same direction and at the same rate across the sky an example of this kind of unanimity was alleged by him in the five intermediate stars of the plough and that the agreement in fortwise motion is no casual one is practically demonstrated by the concordant radial velocities determined at potsdam for four out of the five objects in question all of these approach the earth at the rate of about eighteen miles a second and the fifth and faintest delta Ursae, though not yet measured may be held to share their advance one of them moreover zeta Ursae, alias mizar carries with it three other stars elcor the arab rider of the horse visible to the naked eye besides a telescopic and a spectroscopic attendant so that the group may be regarded as octuple it is a vast compass dr herfler assigned to it in eighteen ninety seven although on grounds more or less hypothetical 
a mean parallax corresponding to a light journey of one hundred and ninety-two years which would give to the marching squadron a total extent of at least fourteen times the distance from the sun to alpha centauri while implying for its brightest member epsilon ursae majoris the lustre of six hundred suns the organizing principle of this grand scheme must long remain mysterious it is no solitary example particular association indeed as was summarized by mitchell far back in the eighteenth century appears to be the rule rather than an exception in the sidereal system stars are bound together by twos by threes by dozens by hundreds our own sun is perhaps not exempt from this gregarious tendency yet the search for its companions has up to the present been unavailing gould's cluster seems remote and intangible captain's collection of solar stars proved to have been a creation of erroneous data and was abolished by his unrelenting industry rather we appear to have secured a compartment to ourselves for our long journey through space a practical certainty has at any rate been gained that whatever aggregation holds the sun as a constituent is of a far looser build than the pleiades or precepe of all such majestic communities the laws and revolutions remain as yet inaccessible to inquiry centuries may elapse before even a rudimentary acquaintance with them begins to develop while the economy of the higher order of association which we must reasonably believe that they unite to compose will possibly continue to stimulate and baffle human curiosity to the end of time End of chapter 12part two chapter thirteen of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clerk chapter thirteen methods of research comparing the methods now available for astronomical inquiries with those in use forty years ago we are at once struck with the fact that they have multiplied the telescope has been supplemented by the spectroscope and the photographic camera now this really involves a whole world of change it means that astronomy has left the place where she dwelt apart in rapt union with mathematics indifferent to all things on earth save only to those mechanical improvements which should aid her to penetrate further into the heavens and has descended into the forum of human knowledge at once a suppliant and a patron alternately invoking help from and promising it to each of the sciences and patiently waiting upon the advances of all the science of the heavenly bodies has in a word become a branch of terrestrial physics or rather a higher kind of integration of all their results 
it has however this leading peculiarity that the materials for the whole of its inquiries are telescopically furnished they are such as come very imperfectly or not at all within the cognizance of the unarmed eye spectroscopic and photographic apparatus are simply additions to the telescope they do not supersede or render it of less importance on the contrary the efficacy of their action depends primarily upon the optical qualities of the instruments they are attached to hence the development to their fullest extent of the powers of the telescope is of vital moment to the progress of modern physical astronomy while the older mathematical astronomy could afford to remain comparatively indifferent to it the colossal ross reflector still marks as to size the ne plus ultra of performance in that line a mirror four feet in diameter was however sent out to Mulburn by the late thomas grubb of dublin in eighteen seventy this mounted in the cassegrainian manner so that the observer looks straight through it toward the object viewed of which he really sees a twice reflected image the dust-laden atmosphere of milbourne is said to impede very seriously the usefulness of this originally fine instrument it may be doubted whether so large a spectrum will ever again be constructed a new material for the mirrors of reflecting telescope proposed by steinheil in eighteen fifty six and independently by Foucault in eighteen fifty seven has in a great measure superseded the use of metallic alloy this is glass upon which a thin film of silver has been deposited by a chemical process originally invaded by liebig it gives a peculiarly brilliant reflective surface throwing back more light than a metallic mirror of the same area in proportion to about sixteen to nine resilvering too involves much less risk and trouble than repolishing a speculum the first use of this plan on a large scale was in an instrument of thirty-six inches aperture finished by calver for dr common in eighteen seventy nine to its excellent qualities turned to account with rare skill his triumphs in celestial photography are mainly due a more daring experiment was the construction and mounting by dr common himself of a five-foot reflector but the first glass disc ordered from france for the purpose proved radically defective when figured polished and silvered toward the close of eighteen eighty eight it gave elliptical instead of circular star images a new one had to be procured and was ready for astronomical use in eighteen ninety one the satisfactory nature of its performance is vouched for by the observations made with it upon jupiter's new satellite in december eighteen ninety two this instrument to which a newtonian form has been given had no rival in respect of light concentration at the time when it was built it has now too the paris fifty inch refractor and the yerkes five foot reflector it is however in the construction of refracting telescopes that the most conspicuous advances have recently been made the harvard college fifteen-inch achromatic was mounted and ready for work 
in june eighteen forty seven a similar instrument had already for some years been in its place at Pulkowa. it was long before the possibility of surpassing these masterpieces of german skill presented itself to any optician for fifteen years it seemed as if a line had been drawn just there it was first transgressed in america a portrait painter of cambridgeport massachusetts named alvin clark had for some time amused his leisure with grinding lenses the singular excellence of which was discovered in england by mr dawes in eighteen fifty three seven years passed and then an order came from the university of mississippi for an object glass of unexampled size of eighteen inches an experimental glance through it to test its definition resulted as we have seen in the detection of the companion of sirius january thirty first eighteen sixty two it never reached its destination in the south war troubles supervened and it was eventually sent to chicago where it served professor hoff in his investigations of jupiter and mr burnham in his scrutiny of double stars the next step was an even longer one and it was again taken by a self-taught optician thomas cook the son of a shoemaker at allerthorpe in the east riding of yorkshire mr newhall of gateshead ordered from him in eighteen sixty three a twenty-five inch object glass it was finished early in eighteen sixty eight but at the cost of shortening the life of its maker who died october nineteenth eighteen sixty eight before the giant refractor he had toiled at for five years was completely mounted this instrument the fine qualities of which had long been neutralized by an unfavorable situation was presented by mr newall to the university of cambridge a few weeks before his death april twenty first eighteen eighty nine under the care of his son mr frank newall it has proved highly efficient in the delicate work of measuring stellar radial motions close upon its construction followed that of the washington twenty six inch for which twenty thousand dollars were paid to alvin clark the most illustrious point in its career entered upon in eighteen seventy three has been the discovery of the satellites of mars once known to be there these were indeed found to be perceptible with very moderate optical means mr wentworth irk saw Deimos with a seven-inch clark but the first detection of such minute objects is a feat of a very different order from their subsequent observation dr c s perception with this instrument in eighteen ninety nine of neptune's cloud belts and his refined series of micrometrical measurements of the various planets attest to the unimpaired excellence of its optical qualities it held the primacy for more than eight years then in december eighteen eighty the place of honor had to be yielded to a twenty seven inch achromatic built by howard grubb son and successor of thomas grubb for the vienna observatory this in its turn was surpassed by two of respectively twenty nine one half and thirty inches sent by gautier of paris to nice and by alvin clark to polkowa 
and an object glass three feet in diameter was in eighteen eighty six successfully turned out by the latter firm for the lick observatory in california the difficulties however encountered in procuring discs of glass of the size and purity required for this last venture seem to indicate that a term to progress in this direction was not far off the flint was indeed cast with comparative ease in the workshop of m file at paris the flawless mass weighed one hundred and seventy kilograms was over thirty-eight inches across and cost ten thousand dollars but with the crown part of the designed achromatic combination things went less smoothly the production of a perfect disc was only achieved after nineteen failures involving a delay of more than two years and the glass for a third lens designed to render the telescope available at pleasure for photographic purposes proved to be strained and consequently went to pieces in the process of grinding it has been replaced by one of thirty-three inches with which a series of admirable lunar and other photographs have been taken nor is the difficulty in obtaining suitable material the only obstacle to increasing the size of refractors the secondary spectrum as it is called also interposes a barrier troublesome to surmount true achromatism cannot be obtained with ordinary flint and crown glass and although in lenses of jana glass outstanding color is reduced to about one-sixth of its usual amount their term of service is fatally abridged by rapid deterioration nevertheless a thirteen-inch objective of the new variety was mounted at Königsberg in eighteen ninety eight and discs of jenna crowd and flint twenty-three inches across were purchased by brashier at the chicago exhibition of eighteen ninety three an achromatic combination of three kinds of glass devised by mr a taylor for messrs cook of york has less serious drawbacks but has not yet come into extensive use meanwhile in giant telescopes affected to the full extent by chromatic aberration such as the lick and yerkes refractors the differences of focal length for the various colors are counted by inches and this not through any lack of skill in the makers but by the necessity of the case embarrassing consequences follow only a small part of the spectrum of a heavenly body for instance can be distinctly seen at one time and a focal adjustment of half an inch is required in passing from the observation of a planetary nebula to that of its stellar nucleus a refracting telescope loses besides one of its chief advantages over a reflector when its size is increased beyond a certain limit that advantage is the greater luminosity of the images given by it considerably more light is transmitted through a glass lens than is reflected from an equal metallic surface but only so long as both are of moderate dimensions for the glass necessarily grows in thickness as its area augments and consequently stops a larger percentage of the rays it refracts so that a point at length arrives fixed by the late dr robinson at a diameter 
a little short of three feet where the glass and the metal are in this respect on an equality while above it the metal has the advantage and since silvered glass gives back considerably more light than speculum metal the stage of equalization with lenses is reached proportionately sooner where this metal is employed the most distinctive faculty of reflectors however is that of bringing rays of all refrangibilities to a focus together they are naturally achromatic none of the beams they collect are thrown away in color fringes obnoxious both in themselves and as a waste of the chief object of astrophysicists greed light reflectors then are in this respect specially adapted to photographic and spectrographic use but they have a countervailing drawback the penalties opposed by bigness are for them peculiarly heavy perfect definition becomes with increasing size more and more difficult to attain once attained it becomes more and more difficult to keep for the huge masses of material employed to form great object glasses or mirrors tend with every movement to become deformed by their own weight now the slightest bending of a mirror is fatal to its performance the effect being doubled by reflection while in a lens alteration of figure is compensated by the equal and contrary flexures of the opposing surfaces so that the emergent beams pursue much the same paths as if the curves of the refracting medium had remained theoretically perfect for this reason work of precision must remain the province of refracting telescopes although great reflectors retain the primacy in the portraiture of the heavenly bodies as well as in certain branches of spectroscopy professor hale accordingly summarized a valuable discussion on the subject by asserting that the astrophysicists may properly consider the reflector to be an even more important part of his instrumental equipment than the refractor a new era in its employment west of the atlantic opened with the transfer from halifax to mount hamilton of the crosley reflector its prerogatives in nebular photography were splendidly indicated in eighteen ninety nine by professor keeler's exquisite and searching portrayals of the cloud worlds of space and those obtained two years later with a similar though smaller instrument by professor ritchie of the york's observatory were fully comparable with them the performances of the yerkes five-foot reflector still belong to the future ambition as regards telescopic power is by no means yet satisfied nor ought it to be the advance of astrophysical researches of all kinds depends largely upon light grasp for the spectroscopic examination of stars for the measurement of their motions in the line of sight for the discovery and study of nebula for stellar and nebular photography the cry continually is more light there is no enterprising head of an observatory but must feel cramped in his designs if he can command no more than fourteen or fifteen inches of aperture and he aspires to greater instrumental capacity not merely with a view to the chances of discovery but for the steady
prosecution of some legitimate line of inquiry thus projects of telescope building on a large scale are rife and some obtain realizations year by year sir howard grubb finished in eighteen ninety three a twenty eight inch achromatic for the royal observatory greenwich the thompson equatorial mounted at the same establishment in eighteen ninety seven carries on a single axis a twenty six inch photographic refractor and a thirty inch silver glass reflector the victoria telescope inaugurated at the cape in nineteen o one comprises a powerful spectrographic apparatus together with a chemically corrected twenty four inch refractor the whole being the munificent gift of mr frank mclean of potsdam at Meudon, at paris at allegheny engines for light concentrations have been or shortly will be erected of dimensions which two generations back would have seemed extravagant and impossible perhaps the finest though not absolutely the greatest among them marked the summit and end of the performances of alvin g clark the last survivor of the cambridge port firm in october eighteen ninety two mr yerkes of chicago offered an unlimited sum for the provisions of the university of that city with a superlative telescope and it happened fortunately that a pair of glass discs nearly forty-two inches in diameter and of perfect quality were ready at hand they had been cast by mantois for the university of southern california when the erection of a great observatory on wilson's peak was under consideration in the clark workshop they were combined into a superb objective brought to perfection by trials and delicate touches extending over nearly five years then the maker accompanied it to its destination by the shore of a far western lake geneva and died immediately after his return june ninth eighteen ninety seven nor has the implement of celestial research he just lived to complete been allowed to rust unburnished manipulated by hale burnham and barnard it has done work that would have been impracticable with less efficient optical aid its construction thus marks a noticeable enlargement of astronomical possibilities exemplified to cite one among many performances by barnard's success in keeping track of clustered variables when below the common limit of visual perception with the lick telescope results have also been achieved testifying to its unsurpassed excellence holden's and chaberley's views of planetary nebula burnham's and hussey's hairbreadth star-splitting operations keeler's measurements of nebular radial motion barnard's detections and prolonged pursuit of faint comets his discovery of jupiter's tiny moon campbell's spectroscopic determinations all this could only have been accomplished even by an exceptionally able and energetic staff with the aid of an instrument of high power and quality but there was another condition which should not be overlooked the best telescope may be crippled by a bad situation the larger it is indeed the more helpless it is to cope with atmospheric troubles these are the worst plagues of all those that afflict the astronomer 
no mechanical still avails to neutralize or alleviate them they augment with each increase of aperture they grow with the magnifying powers applied the rays from the heavenly bodies when they can penetrate the cloud veils that too often bar their path reach us in an enfeebled scattered and disturbed condition hence the twinkling of stars the boiling effects at the edges of sun moon and planets hence distortions of bright effacements of feeble telescopic images hence too the paucity of the results obtained with many powerful light-gathering machines no sooner had the parsontown telescope been built than it became obvious that the limit of profitable augmentation of size had under climatic conditions at all nearly resembling those prevailing there been reached if not overpassed and lord ross himself was foremost to discern the need of pausing to look round the world for a clearer and stiller air than was to be found within the bounds of the united kingdom with this express object mr lassell transported his two-foot newtonian to malta in eighteen fifty two and mounted it there in eighteen sixty a similar instrument of fourfold capacity with which in the course of about two years six hundred new nebula were discovered professor piazzi smith's experiences during a trip to the peak of tenerife in eighteen fifty six in search of astronomical opportunities gave countenance to the most sanguine hopes of deliverance at suitable elevated stations from some of the oppressive conditions of low-level star-gazing yet for a number of years nothing effectual was done for their realization now at last however mountain observatories are not only an admitted necessity but an accomplished fact and newton's long forecast of a time when astronomers would be compelled by the developed powers of their telescopes to mount high above the grosser clouds in order to use them had been justified by the event james lick the millionaire of san francisco had already chosen when he died october first eighteen seventy six a site for the new observatory to the building and endowment of which he had devoted a part of his large fortune the situation of the establishment is exceptional and splendid planted on one of the three peaks of mount hamilton a crowning summit of the california coast range at an elevation of forty two hundred feet above the sea in a climate scarce rivalled throughout the world it commands views both celestial and terrestrial which the lover of nature and astronomy may alike rejoice in impediments to observation are there found to be mostly materially reduced professor holden who was appointed in eighteen eighty five president of the university of california and director of the new observatory affiliated to it stated that during six or seven months of the year an unbroken serenity prevails and that half the remaining nights are clear the power of continuous work thus afforded is of itself an inestimable advantage and the high visual excellences testified to by mr burnham's discovery during a two months trip to mount hamilton in the autumn of eighteen seventy nine of forty-two new double stars with an eight-inch achromatic gave hopes 
since fully realized of a brilliant future for the lick establishment its advantages are shared as professor holden desired them to be by the whole astronomical world a sort of appellate jurisdiction was at once accorded to the great equatorial and more than one disputed point has been satisfactorily settled by recourse to it its performances considered both as to quality and kind are unlikely to be improved upon by merely outbidding it in size unless the care extended upon the selection of its site is imitated professor pickering thus showed his customary prudence in reserving his efforts to procure a great telescope until harvard college owned a dependent observatory where it could be employed to advantage this was found by mr w h pickering after many experiments in colorado california and peru at arquipa on a slope of the andes eight thousand feet above the sea level here the post provided for by the boyden fund was established in eighteen ninety one under ideal meteorological conditions temperature preserves a golden mean the barometer is almost absolutely steady the yearly rainfall amounts to more than three or four inches no wonder then that the seeing there is of the extraordinary excellence attested by mr pickering's observations in the absence of bright moonlight he tells us eleven pleiades can always be counted the andromeda nebula appears to the naked eye conspicuously bright and larger than the full moon third magnitude stars had been followed to their disappearance at the true horizon the zodiacal light spans the heavens as a complete arch the gegenschein forming a regular part of the scenery of the heavens corresponding telescopic facilities are enjoyed the chief instrument at the station a thirteen inch equatorial by clark shows the fainter parts of the orion nebula photographed at harvard college in eighteen eighty seven by which the dimensions given to it in bond's drawing are doubled stars are at times seen encircled by half a dozen immovable diffraction rings up to twelve of which have been counted round a centauri while on many occasions no available increase of magnifying power availed to bring out any wavering of the limits of the planets moreover the series of fine nights is nearly unbroken from march to november the facilities thus offered for continuous photographic research rendered feasible professor bailey's amazing discovery of variable star clusters they belong exclusively to the globular class and the peculiarity is most strikingly apparent in the groups known as o centauri and messier three five and fifteen a large number of their minute components run through perfectly definite cycles of change in periods usually of a few hours altogether about five hundred cluster variables have been recorded since eighteen ninety five it should be mentioned that mr david packer and dr common discerned about eighteen ninety some premonitory symptoms of like fluctuation among the crowded stars of messier five with the bruce telescope a photographic doublet twenty four inches in diameter a store of five thousand six hundred and eighty six negatives 
was collected at arquippa between eighteen ninety six and nineteen o one some were exposed directly others with the intervention of a prism and all are available for important purposes of detection or investigation vapors and air currents do not alone embarrass the use of giant telescopes mechanical difficulties also oppose a formidable barrier to much further growth in size but what seems a barrier often proves to be only a fresh starting point and signs are not wanting that it may be found so in this case it is possible that the monumental domes and huge movable tubes of our present observatories will in a few decades be as much things of the past as huygens aerial telescopes it is certain that the thin edge of the wedge of innovation has been driven into the old plan of equatorial mounting m lowey the present director of the paris observatory proposed to de launay in eighteen seventy one the direction of a telescope on a novel system the design seemed feasible and was adopted but the death of de launay and the other untoward circumstances of the time interrupted its execution its resumption after some years was rendered possible by mr bischoff scheim's gift of twenty five thousand francs for expenses and the coup de or bent equatorial has been since eighteen eighty two one of the leading instruments at the paris establishment its principle is briefly this the telescope is as it were its own polar axis the anterior part of the tube is supported at both ends and is thus fixed in a direction pointing toward the pole with only the power of twisting axially the posterior section is joined on to it at right angles and presents the object glass accordingly to the celestial equator in the plane of which it revolves stars in any other part of the heavens have their beams reflected upon the object glass by means of a plane rotating mirror placed in front of it the observer meanwhile is looking steadfastly down the bent tube towards the invisible southern pole he would naturally see nothing whatever were it not that a second plane mirror is fixed at the elbow of the instrument so as to send the rays which have traversed the object glass to his eye he never needs to move from his place he watches the stars seated in an armchair in a warm room with as perfect convenience as if he were examining the seeds of a fungus with a microscope nor is this a mere gain of personal ease the abolition of hardship includes a vast accession of power among other advantages of this method of construction are first that of added stability the motion given to the ordinary equatorial being transferred in part to an auxiliary mirror next that of increased focal length the fixed part of the tube can be made most indefinitely long without inconvenience and with enormous advantage to the optical qualities of the large instrument finally the costly and unmanageable cupola is got rid of a mere shed serving all purposes of protection required for the coude the desirability of some such change as that which m lowey has realized has been felt by others professor pickering sketched in eighteen eighty one 
a plan for fixing large refractors in a permanently horizontal position and reflecting into them by means of a shifting mirror the objects desired to be observed the observations for his photometric catalogues are in fact made with a broken transit in which the line of sight remains permanently horizontal whatever the altitude of the star examined sir howard grubb moreover set up in eighteen eighty two a kind of siderostat at the crawford observatory cork in a paper read before the royal society january twenty first eighteen eighty four he proposed to carry out the principle on a more extended scale and shortly afterwards undertook its application to a telescope eighteen inches in aperture for the armagh observatory the chief honors however remain to the paris inventor none of the procrastinated causes of failure have proved effective the loss of light from the double reflection is insignificant the menaced deformation of images is through the exquisite skill of the m m henry in producing plain mirrors of all but absolute perfection quite imperceptible the definition was admitted to be singularly good sir david gill stated in eighteen eighty four that he had never measured a double star so easily as he did with y leonis by its means sir norman lockyer pronounced it to be one of the instruments of the future and the principle of its construction was immediately adopted by the directors of the basicon and algiers observatories as well as for a seventeen-inch telescope destined for a new observatory in buenos aires at paris it has since been carried out on a larger scale a coude of twenty-three and one-half inches aperture and sixty-two feet focal length was in eighteen ninety installed at the national observatory and has served m lowey for his ingenious studies on refraction and aberration above all for taking the magnificent plates of his lunar atlas the bent form is capable of being but has not yet been adapted to reflectors the celiostat in the form given to it by professor turner has proved an invaluable adjunct to eclipse equipments it consists essentially of a mirror rotating in forty-eight hours on an axis in its own plane and parallel to the earth's axis in the field of a telescope kept rigidly pointed toward such a mirror stars appear immovably fixed the employment of long focus lenses for coronal photography is thus facilitated and the size of the image is proportional to the length of the focus professor barnard accordingly depicted the totality of nineteen hundred with a horizontal telescope sixty one and one half feet long fed by a mirror eighteen inches across the diameter of the moon on his plates being seven inches the largest siderostat in the world is the paris fifty inch refractor which formed the chief attention of the palais de optique at the exhibition of nineteen hundred it has a focal length of nearly two hundred feet and can be used either for photographic or for visual purposes celestial photography has not reached its grand climateric yet its earliest beginnings already seem centuries behind its present performances the details of its gradual yet rapid improvement 
are too technical a nature to find a place in these pages suffice it to say that the dry plate process with which such wonderful results have been obtained appears to have been first made available by sir william huggins in photographing the spectrum of vega in eighteen seventy six and was then successfully adopted by common draper and jansen nor should captain abney's remarkable extension of the powers of the camera be left unnoticed he began his experiments on the chemical action of red and infrared rays in eighteen seventy four and at length succeeded in obtaining a substance the blue bromide of silver highly sensitive to these slower vibrations of light with its aid he explored a vast unknown and forever invisible region of the solar spectrum presented to the royal society december fifth eighteen seventy nine a detailed map of its infrared portion wavelength seventy six hundred to ten thousand seven hundred and fifty from which valuable inferences may yet be derived as to the condition of the various kinds of matter ignited in the solar atmosphere upon plates rendered orthochromatic by staining with alizarine or other dye stuffs the whole visible spectrum can now be photographed but those with their maximum of sensitiveness near g are found preferable except where the results of light analysis are sought to be completely recorded and since photographic refractors are corrected for the blue rays exposures with them of orthochromatic surfaces would be entirely futile the chemical plate has two advantages over the human retina first it is sensitive to rays which are utterly powerless to produce any visual effect next it can accumulate impression almost indefinitely while from the retina may fade after one-tenth part of a second leaving it a continually renewed tabula rasa it is accordingly quite possible to photograph objects so faint as to be altogether beyond the power of any telescope to reveal witness the chemical disclosure of the invisible nebula encircling nova persei and we may thus eventually learn whether a blank space in the sky truly represents the end of the stellar universe in that direction or whether farther and farther worlds roll and shine beyond veiled in the obscurity of immeasurable distance of many ingenious improvements in spectroscopic appliances the most fundamentally important relate to what are known as gratings these are very finely striated surfaces by which light waves are brought to interfere and are thus sifted out strictly according to their different lengths into normal spectra since no universally valid measures can be made in any others their production is quite indispensable to spectroscopic science fraunhofer who initiated the study of the diffraction spectrum used a real grating of very fine wires but rulings on glass were adopted by his successors and were by norbert executed with such consummate skill that a single square inch of surface was made to contain one hundred thousand hand-drawn lines such rare and costly triumphs of art 
however found their way into very few hands and practical availability was first given to this kind of instrument by the inventiveness and mechanical dexterity of two american investigators both rutherford's and rowland's gratings are machine ruled and reflect instead of transmitting the rays they analyze but rowland's present to them is a much larger diffractive surface and consequently possess a higher resolving power the first preliminary to his improvements was the production in eighteen eighty two of a faultless screw those previously in use having been the inevitable source of periodical errors in striation giving in their turn ghost lines as subjects of spectroscopic study their abolition was not one of rowland's least achievements with his perfected machine a metallic area of six and a quarter by four and a quarter inches can be ruled with exquisite accuracy to almost any degree of fineness he considered however forty three thousand lines to the inch to be the limit of usefulness the ruled surface is moreover concave and hence brings the spectrum to a focus without a telescope a slit and an eyepiece are alone needed to view it and absorption of light by glass lenses is obviated an advantage especially sensible in dealing with ultra or infra visible rays the high qualities of rowland's great photographic map of the solar spectrum were thus based upon his previous improvement of the instrumental means used in its execution the amount of detail shown in it is illustrated by the appearance on the negatives of one hundred and fifty lines between h and k and many lines depict themselves as double which until examined with a concave grating had passed for one and indivisible a corresponding hand drawing for which m tholen received in eighteen eighty six the lalande prize exhibits not the diffractive but the prismatic spectrum as obtained with bisulfide of carbon prisms of large dispersive power about one-third of the visible gamut of the solar radiations a to b is covered by it it includes thirty two hundred lines and is over ten meters long the grating is an expensive tool in the way of light where there is none to spare its advantages must be foregone they could not accordingly be turned to account in stellar spectroscopy until the lick telescope was at hand to supply more abundant material for research by the use thus made possible of rowland's gratings professor keeler was able to apply enormous dispersion to the rays of stars and nebula and so to attain a previously unheard of degree of accuracy in their measurement his memorable detection of nebular movement in line of sight ensued as a consequence professor campbell his successor has since obtained by the same means the first satisfactory photographs of stellar diffraction spectra the means at the disposal of astronomers have not multiplied faster than the tasks imposed upon them looking back to the year eighteen hundred we cannot fail to be astonished at the change the comparatively simple and serene science of the heavenly bodies known to our predecessors almost perfect so far as it went incurious of what lay beyond its grasp has developed 
into a body of manifold powers and parts each with its separate mode and means of growth full of strong vitality but animated by a restless and unsatisfied spirit haunted by the sense of problems unsolved and tormented by conscious impotence to sound and immensities it perpetually confronts knowledge might be said when the mechanique celeste issued from the press to be bounded by the solar system but even the solar system presented itself under an aspect strangely different from what it now wears it consisted of the sun seven planets and twice as many satellites all circling harmoniously in obedience to a universal law by the compensating action of which the indefinite stability of their mutual relations was secured the occasional incursion of a comet or the periodical presence of a single such wanderer chained down from escape to outer space by planetary attraction availed nothing to impair the symmetry of the majestic spectacle now not alone the ascertained limits of the system have been widened by a thousand millions of miles with the addition of one more giant planet and seven satellites to the ancient classes of its members but a complexity has been given to its constitution baffling description or thought five hundred circulating planetary bodies bridge the gap between jupiter and mars the complete investigation of the movements of any one of which would overtask the energies of a lifetime meteorites strangers apparently to the fundamental ordering of the solar household swarm nevertheless by millions in every cranny of its space returning at regular intervals like the comets so singularly associated with them or sweeping across it with hyperbolic velocities brought perhaps from some distant star and each of these cosmical grains of dust has a theory far more complex than that of jupiter it bears within it the secret of its origin and fulfils a function in the universe the sun itself is no longer a semi-fabulous fire-girt globe but the vast scene of the play of forces at yet imperfectly known to us offering a boundless field for the most arduous and inspiring researches among the planets the widest variety in physical habitudes is seen to prevail and each is recognized as a world apart inviting inquiries which to be effective must necessarily be special and detailed even our own moon threatens to break loose from the trammels of calculation and commits errors which sap the very foundations of the lunar theory and suggest the formidable necessity for its complete revision nay the steadfast earth has forfeited the implicit confidence placed in it as a timekeeper and questions relating to the stability of the earth's axis and the constancy of the earth's rate of rotation are among those which behooves the future to answer everywhere there is multiformity and change stimulating a curiosity which the rapid development of methods of research offers the possibility of at least partially gratifying outside the solar system the problems which demand a practical solution are virtually infinite in number and extent and these have all arisen and crowded upon our thoughts within less than a hundred years the sidereal science 
became a recognized branch of astronomy only through herschel's discovery of the revolutions of double stars in eighteen o two yet already it may be and has been called the astronomy of the future so rapidly has the development of a keen and universal interest attended and stimulated the growth of power to investigate this sublime subject what has been done is little is scarcely a beginning yet it is much in comparison with the total blank of a century past and our knowledge will we are easily persuaded appear in turn the merest ignorance to those who come after us yet it is not to be despised since by it we reach up groping fingers to touch the hem of the garment of the most high End of chapter 13 End of a popular history of astronomy during the 19th century